Uh, okay, so in that little intermission, there were some really good questions, which you should ask during the talk, too, because then we could share them with everyone. But that's okay. It's, it's good to ask offline, too. But there was one, one question that I want to share with everyone, and uh, that has to do with all this averaging business I've been making such a big deal about. Well, in the appendix that I was going to try to get to that we didn't, that you can look up in your notes, uh, it turns out that a neutron isn't, a, isn't represented by a state function or a wave function. That's a plane wave. That's just totally unrealistic. If it was, you could be doing an experiment out here at the SNS, and your wave function would be extending all the way across the Atlantic to the ILL and scattering off of something in their spectrometer. Well, that doesn't happen. Neutrons are the wave functions associated with that quantum object are localized. They're in wave packets. And that happens by adding a lot of plane waves together, at least mathematically, to picture it with different, slightly different wave vectors or frequencies. And when you do that, it's like having two waves beating against one another. And if you add them together, with, if they have slightly different wavelengths, <coughs> you'll get them peaking in one place by constructive interference. So a wave packet actually is localized in space. And it turns out that its spatial extent transverse, perpendicular to its momentum uh, wave vector, um, that dimension is of the order, the way that it's prepared in a typical neutron instrument in a reflectometer, it's about a micron or a fraction of a micron. So suppose this is one of the planes in this system that you're reflecting from. And there's a picture in the appendix you can look at. But suppose it's not totally homogeneous. There are green sections and brown sections and white sections and purple sections. If that one micron distance is big enough that it covers all of these pieces on that length scale, then the averaging happens. But if those sections are really big and the wave transverse section is, uh, of the neutron is only that big, then I see green with one neutron, and I see orange with the other neutron, and I get an incoherent sum. And then I have to treat the measured reflectivity that I have as a sum of parts that come from these different areas that you have to determine somehow else. Okay, But then I could weight them. Obviously, in this case, it's mostly green, so that would be like 0.85 and the brown would be maybe 0 0.10 and the purple 0 0.05. And I weight the reflectivities in my models for those different sections because I wasn't averaging over all of that. Okay, So that's an important thing. But that usually doesn't happen unless the length scales are really tens of microns or bigger. And the reason for that is, I always forget to say, is that at these low angles, you know, take my hand as the wave front of that wave packet, in the wave packet, one of the wave fronts. When I come in at low angles, across this direction, it is what it is. It's one micron, and then I don't average in some places. But when I come in like this, the way that the reflected reflection occurs, the whole wave packet goes through, and it scans through that surface, and the wave front is effectively projected across the surface as 1 over the sine of that incident angle. And 1 over the sine of these tiny angles is like 100, factor of 100. So instead of having this 1 micron wave front distance, I have 100 microns averaging across all of this. So we get lucky that it averages. Or not, if you didn't want to average. But you get the idea. OK, I just wanted to, that's important to remember with that averaging business. OK, so the second discussion for us this morning is about uh, polarized neutrons. So a lot of this is going to be discussed in the context of diffraction, elastic scattering at low angles and reflectometry. But it applies to diffraction and to other kinds of scattering experiments that use, make use of the polarization, the, the fact that the neutron has a magnetic moment. OK, so part one, what are basic ideas about neutron and its polarization? Second section we'll talk about is applying neutrons, uh, polarized neutrons, for those hard condensed matter structures that we didn't talk about in the previous lecture. OK, and it's a big part. A lot of people work on, on hard condensed matter systems. 
And then uh, something about polarized neutrons used for other purposes where there is no magnetization of interest, but you can make use of the property of the neutron polarization, and that applies to part four, too, where you can study systems that aren't magnetic but take advantage of the fact that the neutron still has a magnetic moment. And you could use that as a control of the probe that you're using to study those materials. Okay, now this last part is going to just be a preliminary to your lecture tomorrow morning on spin echo. Okay, so I'm not going to say a lot about spin echo, but just give you an idea what you need to know about the polarization to use spin echo. And I'm sure that will get reinforced tomorrow. Okay, so neutrons are fermion. It has a spin half, and it has a moment. And this magnetic moment is, uh, as you will see, has significant consequences on what the wave function, that state function that accompanies that neutron quantum object in its scattering interactions with materials. So we have to, we have to take this into account. Now, for everything we talked about in the previous uh, discussion, if we don't have magnetic materials and the neutrons aren't polarized, we don't have to worry about it. Sometimes it's better not to know too much, right? So what you don't know won't hurt you in that case. However, if we start studying magnetic materials, then it becomes an issue. Okay, so the, so the interaction, however, so again, this is a little complicated. The neutron moment, uh, or the nuclear moments, and the interaction between the moment and the moment of the nuclei is really, really tiny. However, what isn't tiny is the neutron nucleus interaction that's spin dependent. So if the nucleus has a spin that's in one direction and the neutron has a spin, then the nuclear interaction is very strong, okay? Depending on whether the spins are parallel or anti-parallel when they, when they interact. However, the magnetic moment of the neutron interacts very strongly with the unpaired electrons that are distributed throughout the unit cell of some material. All right, let's see what else is there. So this, this is, uh, uh, again, this is a lot of quantum mechanics is, is necessary to describe all of this. And we're not going to you know, study two semesters of quantum mechanics today. But there's a good textbook by Mertzbacher. Uh, it's an older book, but it has a really good description of spin one-half particles, that which would apply to neutrons. So if you're interested, that's one place to go. OK, so here's where, here's where it gets uh, complicated. Remember in the last discussion, we were representing just for uh, as a rudimentary, elementary type description of the neutron wave, this plane wave function. Well, as soon as you take into account the fact that a neutron has spin 1 half, then there are two possibilities, and only two. Neutron's moment in any field can only have a spin eigenstate that's pointing up, or called plus, or pointing down relative to that applied magnetic field. It's a two, it's, it's bipolar. So to describe that, uh, our physicist ancestors, uh, in particular Pauli, invented a way of describing this spin character, quantum spin character of this neutron wave function by uh, spinners, which means that you have two vectors, one that represents the spin up possibility and one that represents the spin down possibility. But what's interesting uh, as far as using that as a probe of materials is that this wave vector for the spin up is different than the wave vector by a, than the, than the wave vector for the spin down state because it depends on the difference in the magnetic field up and down. So that means that there's a uh, splitting, the so-called Zeeman energy that's associated with a neutron in a magnetic field. And so it turns out that the scattering density that we talked about in the previous lecture, this scattering density with the nuclear interaction, has in addition to it a magnetic component. And they add, sca like scalars, scalar, uh, uh, scalar nuclear and scalar magnetic length densities. And this turns out to be a really important relationship that we'll come back to.
OK, so anyway, this makes it such that the wave function is described in this more complicated way. And again, you don't have to really worry about this now. But I just want to point out that all of the formalism, the mathematics formalism that we describe for reflection still holds. It's just a little bit more complicated. Now, instead of solving, for example, for specular reflection, one wave equation, one one-dimensional differential Schrodinger equation, there are two. These are coupled because the neutron in spin-up state reflects from a magnetic material. There is a possibility that it will reflect and come out with the same spin state. Or if it interacts with a down spin state to begin with, it could come back out with that down spin state. And those two interactions are different by that Zeeman energy. Okay? But in addition to all that, a neutron could come in up and get turned around in the interaction and come out upside down and vice versa. So now, instead of one scattering possibility, there are four. So all of this is taken into account by solving these two equations simultaneously. And again, without belaboring the details, we have to treat the potential now as a, as a matrix quantity for the magnetic interaction. Again, thanks to Professor Pauli many years ago. Uh, now we have the same relationship between reflected, uh, sorry, reflected and transmitted amplitudes interacting with this uh, material through the transfer matrix. But now it can, there are four quantities, R plus, R minus, T plus, T minus, and we have to be able to distinguish the, all of these. So magnetic uh, scattering is important for looking at how the electrons are distributed. Let's say I have a piece of hard condensed matter, a crystal cell. Those unpaired electrons have funny orbitals. Some look like these twisted uh, pretzel shapes and so on and so forth. And these can be investigated by doing diffraction from these uh, systems. And the scattering length, even though for the nuclear nucle the nu neutron nucleus interaction, there are <coughs> constant numbers, there are also uh, constant numbers for the magnetic interaction, except because the magnetic interaction is extended over many angstroms of space, whereas the nuclei is at a fraction of a tiny fraction of an angstrom, then this strength of the interaction falls off with higher and higher angle or momentum transfer. So for reflectometry, you don't have to worry too much. It's still pretty constant. But as you go to higher angles, this becomes important. And in fact, conveys the information about how those electrons, unpaired electrons, are distributed in space. But we're not going to focus on that right now. OK, so now. We just said that a neutron can be up or down in an applied magnetic field. There are only two possible states that exist. However, we can have beams, ensembles of neutrons that make up a beam. So suppose I have in that beam 50 neutrons that have spin up and 50 neutrons that have spin down. Well, there's a number that population distribution can be characterized by a polarization, a quantity that describes that. So I can think of a number. This is an abstraction that we invent to describe the properties of the beam, given the two possibilities for the, po for the polarization of an individual neutron. And I can, I can define a polarization along the axis of the, of the magnetic field. Let's say the z-axis is typically chosen such that the number of plus minus the number of minus divided by the total number gives us the polarization. So what, do, what, what is the polarization of a beam that has 50 neutrons up and spin up and 50 spin down? Goose egg, zero. So this is if I have a beam that has something that's not zero, then I say that it has a net polarization. The beam does. OK, so always remember the polarization we have to think of as a characterization of the, of, a, of the beam, of a beam of neutrons, an ensemble, a collection of individual neutrons where each individual neutron can only be up or down. Okay? But P can be any continuous number. <laughs> 
okay, from zero to one. If n plus is 100 and n minus is zero, this is plus one, and if, if vice versa, it's minus one, okay? So this has a lot of important consequences that we'll see. One of which is that if I have a, a beam that is where the polarization axis, the magnetic field that defines the axis of quantization for these spin up, spin down states, let's say it lies initially pointing up in the z direction, but then it just goes into another region of space instantaneously such that now the field is pointing along a perpendicular axis. And it turns out that if I have a beam of polarized neutrons, that polarization vector will start to rotate as it traverses along this new axis in this new field direction. And this is called precession or rotation of the polarization. So this is gonna be really important in your lecture tomorrow for studying these spin echo applications of neutrons. Okay, but let's just, uh, just summarize that when I get, when I go from a, a state where the neutron is pointing, all of the neutrons in the beam are pointing like this in the field that's vertical, and I cross over into a region where it's pointing in a perpendicular direction, as soon as that polarization crosses that boundary, the net polarization of the beam will start to rotate with a, a very uh, well-defined functional form just as a cosine, and the rotational frequency is determined by the difference in the refractive indices for the spin up and spin down state of the individual neutrons. And this is called Larmor precession. Okay, and you'll learn all about this tomorrow, so we're not gonna spend a lot of time on it now. Question? Yes. Um, just, just so I'm clear, uh, so what you're talking about is rotation and polarization. Yes. That's distinct from circularly polarization. Yes. So this is way simpler than light. Light is incredibly complicated. And if you look in one of the appendix slides, there's a, a picture of polarization for light where it's the, the directions of the E and the B fields and how they're related to one another that gives you different types of light polarization, which are much more complicated. It could be circularly polarized, elliptically, linear, all kinds of combinations. But some of the principles are the same, but it's a lot more complicated, okay? So you have to remember that mathematically, the whole polarization business for neutrons is described by that spinner wave function that says fundamentally there are only two ways that the neutron can be, aligned with the field or anti-aligned. But then when I mix up different fractions of the populations of the neutrons that are up and down, I can get a continuous description of the polarization of a beam, of a collection of those neutrons, okay? So this takes a long while to sink in. This is, this is, this is a, a little bit abstract. But again, just so, so you're ready for tomorrow, the polarization can be, again, defined to be up uh, along this direction outside this box. But if that beam with a polarization pointing along the z-axis then traverses the boundary into, instantaneously, it goes into a region of space where the field is now pointing perpendicular, the polarization that was once one pointing up along z will now start to rotate around this direction along this new y-axis. And if it comes out of the box at this point, it will now come out at an angle that's tilted like this at the end. So it now, in this field, if the field is again in the z direction outside the box, it will be a cone rotating around like this. Or the polarization vector will be rotating around the surface of the cone outside. And that's called precession. So usually some people will call this initial change of the polarization direction from pointing along the z to some arbitrary direction, that will be called a rotation of the polarization. And then once it's out in this new alignment in another field that's vertical, that precession, that motion is called precession or Larmor precession to be exact. Yes? With an electric field, no. Okay. 
It aligns just with the magnetic field. Okay, again, this is different than light, okay? A light, remember, light has an electric vector and a magnetic vector. The neutron just has this magnetic component, okay? All right, so uh, if you look at this, before we leave this slide, if you look at this blue arrow, if I make this box bigger, what do you think is going to happen to that blue arrow? It's eventually going to rotate down to the x-axis. If I make it even longer, it's going to rotate down, pointing down. If I make it even longer, I can rotate that polarization of the beam by making a field region of a particular size that matches the strength of the field and the velocity of the neutron going through it so that I can take a neutron and rotate it anywhere we want to rotate it. So this is going to be also useful for doing experiments. Okay, here's a, a, a picture of a typical neutron reflectometer. This is the actual machine and this is a schematic description of all the component optical parts. There's the source, the thigh tube, the monochromator, and then a pair of slits that define the angular divergence of the beam, which also applies to the previous discussion in the last uh, lecture. But in between these slits are placed two other devices. One is a flat plate with a thin film of iron that acts as a polarizer. And there's also a field coil that has a field that points along a direction perpendicular to the guide field, which is vertical in here. So a neutron coming in pointing up can be rotated around to point, or if it comes in minus, it could be rotated around to point up and vice versa, okay? So there's a way by having a polarization selector and a polarization rotator to take the polarization of the beam and go from spin up to spin down state and then analyze what's reflected from some sample to see whether it's been rotated from its initial state up or down before I detect it. So it, what this whole thing just schematically and in general allows you to do is to take a polarized, is to take a beam of neutrons, monochromate it, define the beam direction, angular divergence, and then it allows you to select one spin state. Once you pick that one spin state, then you can further use it with this flipper turned off and just have a plus neutron spin state incident on the sample, or you could make that coil magnetic field amplitude and thickness of the coil such that for that wavelength or velocity neutron, it makes exactly a pi rotation and it comes out upside down in a minus spin state. So we have a means of creating a beam of polarized neutrons either up or down. And then we have, in exactly analogous fashion, a way of taking the neutrons that are just scattered and determining whether they came out in the same spin state or the rotated spin state. Okay? Yes? I think might be a question, but, uh, no questions are stupid. <laughs> yes. Yes. Correct. And only if you go and intervene and select out one of those populations, that's the only way that you can get a beam that's polarized. Because all of the interactions of the neutrons and their moments and the nuclei in the moderators and the, and the cores of the reactors where they're, actually the sources where they're created are randomly oriented. So you have 50-50 probability that they'll come out of those interactions, spin up or spin down. But there are devices, you can take helium-3 gas and orient all of the nuclear moments in one direction. And then you can control with a polarized beam to make all of the interactions plus plus or minus minus and so on. So you're in control if you configure the nuclei and the neutrons to be aligned in one direction. Okay. So remember way back in one of the earliest slides, there was an expression for the refractive index that had inside of it the scattering length density for the nuclear interaction and the scattering length density for the magnetic interaction. For spin up neutrons, those two potentials add together. So the total scattering potential 
is nuclear plus magnetic, big number. Because it turns out that the magnetic moment or magnetic density is usually comparable to the nuclear one. It's very strong. For the other spin state, it's the difference in those two quantities. Now, let me ask you this question. What happens if you pick your materials in a polarizing film, like this orange slab shown here, such that the nuclear scattering density is exactly the same magnitude as the magnetic scattering density? What's the net potential? Another big zero, nothing. So that means if I take a piece of iron, which just happens to have the right nuclear and magnetic scattering densities, if I pass a neutron through it where that magnetization is saturated out of the plane of the paper, then the neutrons that are in the negative spin state will see the nuclear scattering density of the iron and the magnetic scattering density of the iron, and they're both equal and opposite in sign. And so will it reflect from that film? If there's no potential, it will go straight through it and forever be lost. On the other hand, the spin-up neutrons in that unpolarized beam of 50-50 composition will see the addition of those two potentials, and it will strongly reflect specularly from that surface if it's below that critical angle that we talked about earlier. So here is the simplest, simplest uh, polarizer known to people kind, okay? It's the one that is typically used to polarize a neutron beam. And its efficiency approaches 100%. Okay, so in this picture, all the neutrons that are reflected here from this piece of iron up to this critical angle are all in the spin-up state. So we have a perfectly polarized beam, really simply. Okay. So again, if I take into a, if I make use of that kind of polarizing device with this possibility of taking a rectangular region of space with an orthogonal magnetic field direction inside, I have now, in addition to a device for polarizing, I have a, division, a device that I can rotate the polarization of that polarized state to any other direction I want to put it in, okay? So those are the two key devices you need to do the, do the experiments. Okay, so what are neutrons, uh, polarized neutrons used for in studying condensed matter? It's mostly hard condensed matter, and the elastic scattering is used to study structures, how magnetic atomic moments point in materials, and also inelastic scattering is used to measure different spin wave excitations, spin waves, magnons, or whatever within solids. Okay, so here, here's a picture. This is a summary of uh, the most important selection rules that apply and what makes polarized neutron uh, beams so important for doing elastic uh, scattering and structural determinations in magnetic materials. Okay. So imagine that we have uh, a set of atomic planes that extend back throughout a material. And it's made up of different bilayers, let's say. There are several layers of one material, maybe it's iron, and then several layers of the material like, uh, who knows, uh, tungsten that has no magnetic moment. Well, in the magnetic layers, if I have a beam of polarized neutrons incident, from the left, and I arrange it so that the guide field, this magnetic quantization axis in which I've defined the neutrons to be in this vertical polarization state, either pointing up plus or pointing down minus, if they scatter from a material that has net magnetizations where all of the atomic moments in these planes are pointing in this direction, so if I add all these together, I have a net M pointing like this, let's say at a 45 degree angle for this illustration, then when the neutrons come in and reflect with, from this particular plane, it turns out that those cross sections we talked about are such that all of the components of that magnetization that are projected along the vertical axis, along the initial polarization axis, will have uh, 
a cross-section that does not result in a spin flip. And it will add to the, mag to the nuclear component. So B is the nuclear scattering amplitude. P is the magnetic scattering amplitude. The cosine of this 45 degrees gives us a particular fraction of this that adds or subtracts to the nuclear part depending on whether the neutron is spin up or spin down. Now, on the other hand, the horizontal projection of that net magnetization relative to the incident polarization, which was along the vertical, will result in purely magnetic scattering with no interference with the nuclear part. And it will give rise to scattering that spin flip. So neutron comes in plus will scatter into the minus state. Neutron comes in minus will scatter into the positive state. OK? All right, so these are two powerful selection rules because if I measure a beam plus to plus, minus to minus, plus to minus, and minus to plus, if I measure those four cross sections all at the same wave vector transfer, I have four different numbers now, I can deduce from these set of selection rules what the orientation, not only what the magnitude of the moment was, if I know the nuclear scattering constituents, but I can determine what direction those moments pointed in the plane. OK? So if all the moments were pointed up along the vertical, I would measure an interference where the cosine of the angle is 0. This is 1. I would get a complete interference between the nuclear and the magnetic parts, the maximum possible. Okay? It would be a big number for where it added and a smaller number where it subtracted. How much spin flip scattering would, would there be for that situation? What's the sign of zero degrees? So there would be no spin flip scattering. So you would know just looking at the data, two year cross sections are two different numbers, and then two cross sections aren't there. Okay, so you know right away just by that simple observation that the moments in your sample are all pointing along the up a positive direction. OK, now that's just talking about that one plane. Now suppose your sample has different directions and successive planes. Well, then when you write out the structure factor and you sum all the terms from one, two, three, and so on planes all the way back, then you can get a picture of the whole solid, the whole material. You can get a depth profile of not only the moments the magnitudes of the magnetizations in those successive planes, but how the moments orient in those planes. You get the whole picture, the whole three-dimensional picture. So this is extremely powerful. There are other selection rules for other geometries. You can study spiral structures and so on. But we won't spend a lot of time on that. We'll just summarize it in the next set of slides. So let's go back again and talk about the simplest cases, because this is the uh, most important point. This is a highly schematic picture of, a set of those atomic planes that we looked at in a previous slide, where in each one of those atomic planes back into the crystal, all the moments are pointing along the vertical direction. So this is a simple ferromagnet. All of the magnetic atomic moments point in the same direction. So in this case, when I scatter a neutron in a reflection geometry in a specular condition, out like this, in at this angle, out like this, and I measure that as a function of that, we will get two scattering, reflection, or diffraction profiles that look like this. It turns out that these subsidiary maxima are due to the total number of planes in the sample. If there are 10, planes that are 10 minus 2 of these subsidiary oscillations. And they have to do some of the ass during the intermission. These come from the total thickness of the film. OK, but at this peak here, this peak where the intensity is a maximum corresponds to 2 pi over the characteristic spacing between those atomic planes of magnetic moments. All right. But you will see that for the plus plus cross section, so plus neutrons scatter to plus neutrons, there is a very large peak there. For plus to minus, that peak is greatly diminished if it exists at all, because that's the situation where the nuclear and the magnetic parts are subtracting from one another. 
So right away, just looking at this information, you know that you have a ferromagnetic structure because there are two cross sections missing. There's no plus minus and there's no minus plus. There are no components in the magnetization along the horizontal axis. Boom. There's your fingerprint, if you like. That's the fingerprint of a ferromagnetic material. Now, let's consider an antiferromagnetic material. And in this case, it's such that in a very small field, the fer antiferromagnetic direction is defined to be perpendicular to that. So now, things get a lot more complicated in a, in a sense. Since all of the moments now lie on the there is, in fact, no non-spin flip scattering. What you see for plus plus and minus minus is only coming from the nuclear scattering densities of those planes. There's no magnetic contribution to these two sections. And as a consequence, they plot right on top of one another. They're exactly the same. If I look at what happens in the spin flip channels from plus to minus and minus to plus, so incident plus again, minus reflected, minus incident plus reflected, again, those turn out to be the same because there's no interference with the nuclear in any case, but they occur with a big peak at this position. And this position is exactly half of that position. Why is that? Anybody have any idea why this peak doesn't occur under the nuclear peak? It turns out that if I look at this, this is the unit cell. It repeats from here to here, here to here, here to here. Where does the unit cell repeat over here? Not here, it goes from right to left. And it doesn't come back right again until you're at twice the distance. So remember our reciprocal relationship? If the distance is twice in real space, then it's one half the distance in reciprocal or scattering space. So the fact that this unit cell, the repeat unit, has doubled in the real space, it means that in the, refra in the diffracted space, that feature is at half the position, inverse to it. So right away, as soon as you just look at this, boom, there's the reflection fingerprint that tells you that the structure is a simple antiferromagnetic. This is, qual I mean, you can analyze this quantitatively and get the magnitudes of the moments and so on and so forth, but just by looking at this data qualitatively, you know what kind of magnet it is. So all of this complication that happens because the neutron has a spin turns out to be a huge advantage in the sensitivity of the probe for looking at these structures. All right, now let's get crazy and go to even more complicated structures. Here's a canted antiferromagnetic structure. Now you have components of this magnetization projected both to the vertical and onto the horizontal axes relative to the initial quantization direction. So now you get plus plus and minus minus scattering. The nuclear and magnetic both interfere with one another, but with different magnitudes depending on what the projections on those axes are. And in the spin flip scattering, there are projections along the horizontal that look very much like the simple antiferromagnetic case. So again, looking at this structure, you know that the moments, it's an antiferromagnetic structure that has, or it's called a ferrimagnetic structure because it has a component, a net component, but it also has an oscillatory component, okay? Now, you can even study helical structures where the rotation of the magnetization progresses along Z in a circular fashion as a function of depth. And these structures are correspondingly more complicated. But on proper mathematical analysis, this can only be observed for this kind of structure. Yes? You can use powders, but then you average orientationally over all those directions. So the answer to that is suppose your unit cells within the single crystal grain that makes up those powders. So uh, the question was, I should be repeating the questions, for a powder sample, powder sample is composed of small pieces of perfect single crystal and a collection of those 
are randomly oriented in the sample so that all directions are present simultaneously when you scatter from that sample. So imagine this pattern from one set of crystallites that has this orientation, then take another section of your powder that has an orientation rotated from this and another rotated from that, and you sum over all those rotated things and you'll get a neck pattern that tells you what, uh, what you get. I, I think there is a lecture on powder diffraction, Brian, coming up, so you will see that discussed in more detail, okay? But it's actually, basically, you're rotationally averaging everything. So to get the maximum information content, you want to have a single crystal sample, if possible. Yes. Um, could you get something useful with powder if it were um, uh, uh, very heavily textured? In the Absolutely, powder? yes. But the, the, that's, a, that's a double-edged sword. <laughs> you get information, but if you want to get the information about what the in structure is, then you not need to know what degree of texturing there is. It's like, is there a preferred orientation so that your weighting is not isotropic, not equal around all four pi, but it's pointed in one direction. If you know that, then you can take advantage of that to help analyze the data, because the data will look different than the totally isotropic average. Great questions. Awesome questions. Yes? Um, I'm curious for the instrument OK. Not only is that instrument dependent, but it's source dependent. <laughs> you know, if you're at the SNS, and, and as opposed to being at some very small reactor facility, you can have tremendously larger number of neutron, neutrons incident on the sample. It, it, and it also depends on the scattering powder, the power of the particular sample that you're looking at. If your sample contains something like a rare earth like dysprosium or holmium or gadolinium where the number of Bohr magnetons is like 5 to 10 Bohr magnetons compared to some weak ferromagnet where the, where the magnetic moment is 0.1 Bohr magneton, since the scattering is proportional to the square of the magnetization, then that's a huge difference in how what it takes to be able to see that magnetic structure. So it varies all over the map. So it's not only how strong the source is, how good the instrument is, optimized for looking at that type of sample, but also on what the sample, what the magnitudes and the moments in the sample actually are. So that's a, that's a question that's unanswerable, unless you know the specifics of the system that you're looking at. But then, but if you do know that, like in the case of the reflectometry, you could calculate immediately what you would see in one of these profiles. You would see where to, you would see whether the reflectivity is about five percent or ten percent, or whether it's you know somewhere down in the couple of percent region, right? You could just model that. So those are knowable answers if you know have a model for the system that you're interested in, or an idea of what it might look like. Of course, if you knew exactly what it was, you wouldn't be doing the experiment either. But, but you can estimate based on reasonable assumptions what you would see. Okay. All right. Great. Okay. So getting back to this theme of layered materials, it's really uh, so now we have all kinds of physical vapor deposition techniques, chemical deposition techniques, chemical vapor deposition techniques, all kinds of ways of making what amount to be perfect single crystal layered systems epitaxially. So this opens a lot of opportunities up for doing systematic studies. For example, suppose you have in the bottom here a set of atomic planes. Let's say this is iron with all the moments ferromagnetically aligned in this direction. And then you put a material in between say chromium or something else that is, has no net magnetization. Let's say it's tin or something that's totally non-magnetic. And then put another magnetic layer of iron on top of that. You can right away ask the question about how these magnetic moments interact with the magnetic moments in this adjacent layer. So bottom ferromagnetic layer, 
with an intervening non-magnetic layer? How does the interaction between these two layers, what happens when you have this in between? Is it a function of the thickness of this layer, intervening layer? Is it a function of whether this is insulator, conductor, semiconductor, superconductor? So you can just let your imaginations run wild and come up with all kinds of interesting brand new materials that you want to see how the magnetization is affected. And I'll give you a really famous example uh, of, of, of one of these systems that is used in all of our computer devices, hard drives. So you can also study the effect of strain at the interface, whether you put hydrogen or some other interstitial quantity into the material. You can study it as a function of magnetic field, temperature, and so on and so forth. So it's a way of doing the reductionist scientific approach of studying how things happen on a, in a very controlled, controlled manner. So the idea is you make a system and then you do the reflection geometry scattering from this and see how these things, how the magnetizations, for example, change under different conditions. Here's just one example. It turns out in an iron chromium system, the irons will be pretty much ferromagnetic blocks with a spiraling chromium layer in between. And these will all tie together in some commensurate fashion depending on what the spacings of those layers are. And this has been studied in great detail in many systems like this. And you could get really atomic accurate information about these magnetizations profiles, these magnetic architectures, if you like. Here's just one other example. You can study whether these are, in fact, ordered, correlated with one another, or just randomly oriented. What are well-defined, sharp peaks when everything is correlated in registry become relatively broad, washed-out peaks as they become uncorrelated. So again, not only are you studying structure within a small volume of material, but you're studying how those structures in some small volume here are correlated or related to those same similar regions in other places in this superstructure. Okay. So here's the famous example. So uh, Peter Grunberg and, and, and Furt, uh, several years ago, 10, 20 years ago, discovered that if you take two ferromagnetic layers and put an in intervening layer, non-magnetic layer, depending on what the distance of that, or what the thickness of that intervening layer is between the two ferromagnetic layers, in some cases, the two ferromagnetic layers, pretend my fingers are at a moment's pointing up, if they're all aligned, then the magnetic resistance of that device is relatively small. But by changing the thickness of the intervening layer, they could get a system where the two ferromagnetic capping layers orient in an anti-parallel direction, and the resistance goes way up. So here now you have a giant, it turns out to be a huge effect, it changes the resistance by a great deal. You have a, a giant magnetoresistance effect which can be reused, and guess what? In magnetic recording disks as a way to write and read information, okay? So what is the mechanism for this? Why is it that these two layers align parallel at one thickness of an intervening spacing layer and then become anti-parallel for another thickness? Well, it turns out that the question was answered by neutron scattering. Here is a system, this is just a generic uh, ferromagnetic layer of gadolinium and a non-magnetic layer of yttrium in between. This is repeated over and over. So I have magnetic, non-magnetic layers, one after another in a big super lattice. And if you do neutron scattering from this, you find that in this schematic picture here, that under, for certain thicknesses, let's say for 10 gadolinium planes, 10 of these orange arrows, interspaced with six yttrium atomic planes in between here, then the layers in successive neighboring gadolinium plates or slabs will be parallel in this arrangement. 
But if you change that to, let's say, 10 layers of intervening yttrium, then instead of being like this, they go like this, or almost like that, in this canted, anti, almost anti-ferromagnetic or anti-parallel arrangement. And this was seen by just observing, just like we described a few minutes ago, looking at those four cross-sections for plus, plus, minus, minus, plus, minus, minus, plus. From that, from these different uh, cross-sections where you see peaks in one cross-section and not in the others, you can deduce that these orientations change for different thicknesses of the yttrium. And that happens because the interaction, if you plot the potential of the interaction between the two ferromagnetic blocks, it varies by this long range indirect exchange interaction, this so-called RKKY interaction, and it oscillates as a function of distance. And these points match the observed reflectivity, polarized neutron reflectivity exactly. So it's a very, that's the only way you can understand what the mechanism was that gave rise to that really important uh, effect that was used in, uh, in, those, in that computer application. Okay, I'm just gonna end up here by just showing you very briefly that remember we were talking about using uh, different reference layers to study non-magnetic materials like biological systems. If you use a magnetic layer here as your reference layer, instead of doing hydrogenation or deuteration or substitution in the stuff that you're sampling, you, uh, it's, it's important because you avoid the potential disruption of the system by trying to remove hydrogens and replace them with deuteriums. First of all, you have to know exactly where the substitutions took place, which can be done, but it's laborious. And you don't know whether there's going to be an isotopic effect because deuterium actually weighs a lot more than hydrogen. Okay, so the idea then is instead of using hydrogen deuterium substitution in studying a lipid bilayer system, for, the, for example, a biological system, you can put below the system that you're interested in up here a buried magnetic layer, which does not in any way chemically interact with the stuff that you're interested in. And then you could use polarized neutrons and with plus neutrons see one value for this magnetic scatter length density. And for minus neutrons, see a different scatter length density. And then you have, with those two sets of reflectivity, two composite data reflectivity sets that you can use to solve for the reflection amplitude that corresponds to this part that you're interested in and solve that right away. Okay? So that, I just wanted to say that. It has, this is just the details of how that works. And there's an example of how different the actual data looks. It's very sensitive. And here's some examples. These are for you to look at that were actually done to deduce the structure of this, of where this biological macromolecule sits in that lipid layer using this spin sensitive or uh, phase sensitive neutron reflectivity technique with magnetic layers. Okay, in the last one minute, I will just mention something about what you're going to talk about in tomorrow's lecture. So remember we said that we can take the polarization of the beam. Once I have a polarized beam by my polarizing device, by the transmission through this reflecting mirror that picks out one spin state, I can get a perfectly polarized beam. And then what if I pass it through a region where now instead of the magnetic field pointing up and down, it's pointing right to left, orthogonal to it, I can take that polarization and rotate it anywhere I want. But suppose we rotate it not from up to down, but we rotate it now so that it's exactly perpendicular, so that the polarization that goes into this region of red, this red box, it comes out with the, spin, with the polarization of the beam in this plane, which is now perpendicular to the field that's applied. So I rotate, it goes into this other region, and now it will start to precess like this. And as it goes across this blue region, it will just keep rotating at the Larmor frequency and come out. And then we can rotate what's left up again and see how much, what the rotation angle of the final polarization direction was when it comes out. And I analyze this statistically by looking at many, many neutrons in that whole ensemble of the beams. 
Okay, well, that's nice, but what does that tell us? Well, let's look at an overhead view. And let's say that I have here a, sa a sample that scatters a polarized neutron beam that's now in this precessing state. And I go through this precession field region. Well, if I go straight through like this, then the neutron's going to precess n number of times depending on how strong the field is, what the wavelength is, in other words, how fast it's going across the region, and what the length of the region is. So suppose we go straight across like this. Well, suppose we turn in going across, the conditions are such that the field strength, the length, and the wavelength are such that we make exactly 1,000 rotations. And if I started out pointing along this axis, I come out pointing in the same direction. Now suppose that the sample scattered some of the neutrons to a different angle. Well, is the path length S the same as L? It's longer, right? So what does that mean? Are there going to be more or fewer precessions? There are going to be more because it has to go further. So instead of coming out of here with 1,000 rotations, it will come out with 1,000 and a half of a rotation. Well, the difference between 1,000 and a half, that's a really small number. This angle is really, really tiny. But what's the difference in a half of a rotation? If I come out pointing like this and I rotate back in this second device, I go up into the plus state, right? If I come out just a half a rotation off and I rotate, where's it going to come out pointing? Down. That's a really easily measured number. So by having fields, large fields, long distances, uh, we can make a device that's exquisitely sensitive to very, very small changes in angle, which I might not be able to measure by using some collimating device. It could be a tiny fraction of a second of arc. So this use of the polarization as a tag, as a ruler, is very, very important. And you can imagine it's good at not only measuring very small angular changes, but what if the scattering in that sample was inelastic so that the neutron, instead of changing angle, it just changed energy so that it had a velocity that moved a little bit more slowly through that medium. Then it can come out with a very tiny energy change, but with a big change in that polarization angle. So here's a really sensitive way of measuring very small angular deviations and very small energy changes. And this is what you're going to talk about tomorrow. OK? All right, I think, yeah, I, I mean, this is the spin echo technique. And I won't tell you, there's a really neat way of even using very divergent beams and still take advantage of this polarization rotation by reversing the field direction in two precession uh, sections. But that's tomorrow's discussion. OK, then there's some appendices, and I think we're good. And any questions? <laughs>